Hi folks, this is Roj. Um, this will be another talk. Uh, we're going to continue uh, on with what we were talking about last week. Uh, if uh, you haven't watched the video, it's out on the website. It's the one that was uh, 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 June 19th of 2019, and that leads into this. Uh, we're going to continue talking a little bit more on courts of law, and I want to do uh, some discussion on uh, the need to to be able to hold corporations accountable uh, so I'm, we're going to talk about that and uh, and you know try to transition into that so uh, hi all you folks out there I got a few people that are out on the line want to want to help me out with this so uh, um, I'm not going to give you all their names uh, it's not that they're shy uh, if they want to introduce themselves they can uh, but there are some people that are not on the the, the mess uh, uh, can't speak so hey roadhouse is here i know that uh we got Lori jean drabeck she's here and then david andrews here and uh of course my wife Ileon, she's uh doesn't have her mic on so she's just sitting out there and just uh hanging back so all right uh all right so we're going to continue on uh Lori sent me some bullet points that she will want me to at least touch on and let's see, uh, those are, okay, she says, uh, here's one of the, uh, bullet point number one, she says, would jurors and ju judges have to be from the same state since true courts of law uh, would uh, all be the same? Uh, ideally, you'd want, uh, you would want jurors uh, as, as close to uh, the De defendant as, as possible or the plaintiffs uh, okay it, 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 as close to the area of controversy as possible now there are issues where if uh, uh, if there's a lot of like pretrial publicity and uh, uh, something that would actually taint the jury pool or bias the jury pool then of course you, you might need to move that to some place where you can select jurors that uh, that don't have uh, the same type of exposure to that that information which is you know for the most part it's it, it's very similar to how a legal administrative or procedural court, uh, uh, handles things. I mean, the same types of things uh, uh, apply. Um, so it, it it does help to have a have have a judge who is at least familiar with uh, uh, those certain things and people who are you know at least competent enough in how how to conduct a um, a court of law to uh, be able to properly advise the jurors. Uh, however, the jurors themselves have to have a pretty good uh, idea of what you know what real law is so that they can recognize a true crime when they, when they see it now uh you you want to have juries uh, that are based on people's peers uh, that that's really problematic so if you're a person who's very knowledgeable in divine law uh your peers can't be people who are ignorant of that divine divine law because they are technically not your peers so therefore they're not in a position to quote unquote stand in judgment over you so um, that that goes into the whole idea of you know 12 reasonable jurors being required to conduct a uh, court of law if people don't have a, a, a you know a, a constructive education in basic d divine law then uh, they they lack the lack the knowledge to even to even uh, uh, properly even witness a crime in law so uh, they uh, if they can't be a witness then they really can't be a juror so um, they would be excused by by reason of uh, well I don't think you could say uh, incompetence but you would probably call it something nice like eligibility so they're just ineligible or disqualified from serving um, and that's technically a, a prior oath that nullifies their uh, their ability to serve on a uh, court of law okay so uh, did that satisfy your your question Lori yes it did okay all right, so he said, would DNA evidence be able to be used because it's not 100% accurate? Um, DNA evidence is, is just like any other evidence. Um, 
one of the problems with D using DNA evidence right now is the chain of custody isn't reliable. And what do I mean by that? Um, there was an FBI lab here in Houston that was caught falsifying DNA evidence, right? So local law enforcers, uh, enforcement agencies, and, uh, and juries and, and, and attorneys were submitting DNA for testing, uh, specifically prosecutors who were trying to get convictions, and the, the uh, crime lab was falsifying the results. Okay, so the state of Texas had to turn out a bunch of uh, 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 people who were convicted based on DNA evidence because the crime lab here uh, uh, that the FBI ran was totally corrupt. Okay, that's where it gets really dangerous because there, there's a big problem in that law enforcement can go to a hospital and request your biological samples like the FBI and all kinds of law enforcement. These people can actually get a hold of your DNA. Okay, and that's a big problem. So if you go and give blood or if, you, uh, if they take blood from you for testing, um, you know, what happens to that DNA? Well, we don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what happens to that DNA. They probably file it. They probably freeze it and file it and store it so that if they need your DNA, they, they have it. Now, why is that a problem? Well, if you can imagine if you have corrupt officials in government who can gain access to your biological samples, let's just say a vial of your blood, they can put your DNA on, at, at any crime scene they want. And that's a big problem, right? And then if people are of the mind of saying, oh, well, you know, DNA evidence, that's, uh, that, you know, you know, that's irrefutable. Well, yeah, the DNA evidence itself may be irrefutable, However, how that a DNA got there it may not necessarily because I, you know, I bled at the scene, right? So I mean, there there's a matter of reliability here. Do do we trust our uh, the law enforcement people to to be t uh, people of integrity? Well, they're only as good as the worst of them, and and quite frankly, based on some of the recent news. Uh, broadcast was specifically with the FBI. Uh, they don't have a really good record. Um, I don't think uh, I don't think the American people have very much confidence in the FBI at all. Uh, if they do, uh, they must be like somebody like Sean Hannity, who swears up and down that the rank and file FBI agents are uh, are uh, you know great great people of integrity however uh, my exposure to FBI agents here in Texas is uh, they're completely corrupt and that their corruption actually bled over into the stack Texas state government and uh, uh, quite specifically the Texas Attorney General's office the head uh, law enforcement officer in Texas and uh, quite frankly I mean you you've got violations of both law and statute on the state and federal level all over the place which uh, to this point for seven years have not been addressed by anybody in fact there ain't no DA uh, in any of the counties that you want to touch it uh, Texas Rangers don't want to touch it um, the new attorney general doesn't want to touch it the current former attorney general who is now the governor he certainly don't want to talk to me and there ain't a single judge in Williamson County that even wants to talk to me they don't even want me near their courtroom all right, so that's that's a huge problem. Uh, so I mean, we're gonna have to stop relying on you know corporate fiction because that that's what our government agencies are. Uh, I, I've talked to Williamson County uh, uh, sheriff's deputies and I've asked them specifically, "Are you peace officers?" And the answer I got from them, he says, "No, we're strictly commercial." And what does that mean? Well, they're revenue officers; they're not uh, peace officers. And although they might swear to uh, uphold the Constitution of these United States, they're still a commercial entity, and they're under the thumb of, of central bank interest. So uh, you, you're not getting a fair shake from these guys. Now, if there was a, a true court of law here, they could bind, bind themselves under the authority of that true court, at which point that they could return to being actual peace officers. And as far as rank-and-file municipal code enforcement, uh, the, these are not 
peace officers. They're simply revenue officers, and uh, they're you know they're they're just conducting business, right? And 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 not only that, but these revenue officers have no duty whatsoever to place themselves in between you and some you know some insane bad guy uh, you know with a machete. Uh, they they don't even have to step in and intercede. There's there's no, they have no duty to protect you from the bad guys. So in essence, what they are is the police. And what is police? Well, police is to walk around and pick up the garbage. And uh, a lot of the times, the police just sit around and they wait for this stuff to happen, and then they just clean up the mess. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I know that there's a lot of police officers that want to be uh, a little bit more than just you know, somebody that cleans up the mess. Uh, but unfortunately, the system that they're trapped in doesn't really allow for them to do a whole lot of that, and that's unfortunate. Uh, so uh, was uh, was that satisfactory? I mean, uh, my answer to DNA is it's only as good as the people that are handling the evidence. Uh, it, it, can be, it can be very reliable, uh, but... Uh, well, look at the uh, look at the case of the O.J. Simpson trial. I, I mean, uh, there was a problem with the chain of custody there. So at any time you have people uh, who are responsible for maintaining the integrity of the DNA who who simply choose not to do that, then that evidence becomes tainted and uh, it becomes reliable. I mean, uh, unreliable. So I mean, these are questions that the juries of, of these particular courts would have to answer. Uh, and it would be incumbent on any defendant to actually ask those questions to when he's defending himself. And certainly if he's got good counsel in law, that that counsel in law would uh, would at least, ra uh, you know, uh, remind him that he needs to do that. Or, you know, or, or you know, uh, a, because in a true court of law, you stand up for yourself. Now, you, you, you can ask and you can consult counsel that you're free to do that. But that counselor does not represent you in a court of law. You represent, you are yourself. You require no representation in a court of law. So was, was that answer satisfactory, Laurie? Yes. Okay. All right. So your third bullet point is uh, discuss this uh, and, and why equal protection applies. Ah, equal protection. Equal protection under the law. Uh, well, equal protection uh, applies because... Uh, divine law is supreme law. Okay, uh, any colorable law, any procedural law, or administrative law, policy, regulation, statute, or code uh, is not supreme. Okay, uh, so equal protection under the law, everybody is subject uh, subject to gravity. Uh, it's uniform. It's equal, and everybody uh, is subjected to, uh, to gravity equally. Uh, s some people weigh more, and that's because uh, proportionally they have more mass. But uh, in that, gravity is very fair. Uh, that's the way the law works. Equal protection means that you don't have people uh, where the uh, divine law applies and people uh, that divine law doesn't apply. Like, for instance, in our administrative and procedural courts, these commercial courts that we have here in this country now, uh, the banks have wholly immunized themselves from any action of our courts. So, uh, as a consequence, bank stooges like uh, James Comey, he walks around, thumbs his nose to the law, and has very little fear of ever being prosecuted at all uh, uh, in a court. Uh, Anthony Weiner himself had to actually cooperate and, and, and consent to his own prosecution. If he didn't consent, they couldn't apply it. Well, technically what happened was the sovereign bank, who, uh, who uh, enjoys sovereign immunity, uh, what they, they basically said, well, these, these people are under our protection and you're not to prosecute them. And so what do you got? You've got our Department of Justice walking around there, uh, you know, investigating, and then they're investigating, and then investigating, and then investigating, and hopefully the people forget that, uh, you know, a crime has been committed because they don't want to come out and tell people, hey, wait a minute, we've got two-tier justice system here. So in a true court of law, uh, there is equal protection. The law applies to everybody uniformly. Uh, fairly, evenly, and uh, and 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 justly, uh, in in the systems that we have set up here in this country, it is not, 
it is not equal protection. You have different classes of people that enjoy more protection and other classes of people who, uh, quite frankly, uh, just fill our jails up. So I don't, uh, uh, well, I mean, look at, uh, look what happened in the Jesse Smollett case. I mean, anybody else who would stage their own uh, 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 hate crime uh, would already be convicted and already serve in a prison sentence. But this guy, of course, he was special. Uh, and uh, uh, they just bent over backwards and let him go. And in so doing, broke all kinds of laws. And that's still, uh, that's still being filtered out right now. Um, what the, what he did was technically commit a material fraud. Not only that, but that material fraud creates a huge inju injury. Why? Because when people lose their faith in a in, in a quote unquote any kind of uh, a system of law, legal or otherwise, then that's a very that's very dangerous for that for that system and and the people for, that rely on that system to keep the bad guys off the street. Um, I'm sorry, Jesse Smollett is not a good guy. Uh, Jesse Smollett is a bad guy, and that guy needs to be in jail for a while because he has, he does not understand that what he did was very wrong. Uh, I, I think if he spends uh, you know five years in prison, uh, he would realize not only that, but there'd be a lot of other people in his uh, particular case who would realize that uh, uh, what, what he did was actually wrong, and it's just something that you just don't do. It's a fraud. Right, he tried to bl he he tried to pin a, a fake crime on a whole group of people, tarnish a whole group of people, and and uh, you know for political purposes, uh, and and uh, self-aggrandizement. Right, so he, he he wanted more money from the, his employers by you know staging this the this, this farce hate crime, and and not only that, but he's unrepentant. He's not sorry for doing it. You know, so as far as I'm concerned, throw the book at him. Uh, I, I think he would become repentant if he was uh, uh, had to serve out, you know, maybe three to five years in prison for, for f criminal fraud. I mean, you know, I, I mean, that that's very dangerous territory there because, you know, people want to uh, want to believe that the society around them is protecting their interests. And when you have instances like what happened there, where it looks like the state of Illinois law enforcement uh, and, and justice system basically just kowtowed to a bunch of special uh, nation, national special interests and, and specific classes of people and, uh, and and just just let a criminal walk away. You don't do that. That's very dangerous. That causes people not to obey the law. You know, Why? You know, because I, you know, all these people are saying, well, hey, you know, uh, uh, why are you prosecuting me? You didn't prosecute uh, uh, Jesse Smollett. You know, you know, that's that's not equal protection under the law. You know, e e equal protection under the law uh, uh, is violated with respect to the border. Um, I mean, uh, uh, Mexican nationals and U.S. citizens, they're not the same. Well, they're technically not the same. But nobody is going to the American people and explaining to the American people the reason why Mexican nationals do not need a driver's license, that they don't need insurance, and they can drive drunk without being prosecuted. Why? Because they are not U.S. citizens. They're not bound to the contract, the social contract. They're treated under, under treaty as, you, uh, as Mexican nationals who, who actually enjoy their constitutionally protected rights. Whereas U.S. citizens ha are presumed to have waived all their constitutionally protected rights in favor of civil rights. And those civil rights, of course, have been under suspension since the Martial Law Act of 1933 and a whole host of continuance, uh, continuances on, on that, uh, plus additional uh, states of emergencies that have been declared and never been rescinded. Uh, that uh, pretty much give the executive branch uh, full free control over all of the all of the U.S. citizens, and they can do anything. Uh, uh, and and you know these U.S. citizens they they can't stand on their even their civil rights. 
So, uh, I mean, that's technically, that, that, that's actually just slavery, a livestock management program. That's all that is. You know, I, I mean, these people are saying, hey, I have constitutional rights. Well, one, they're making a mistake. There's no such thing as constitutional rights. There are constitutionally protected rights. Uh, but a U.S. citizen, technically, under the 14th Amendment, has waived all of their constitutional protected rights. Uh, most people don't know that, and that's that's and, and and because they don't know that that's evidence right there that uh that that people cannot enjoy rights why because if you don't know who you are uh where you are what you are uh then and 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 do not know the law sufficiently to realize that you're irresponsible and incompetent then you can't exercise a right because of that irresponsibility so with rights come responsibility. If you're irresponsible, you cannot exercise a right. If you're ignorant of the law, you are irresponsible. Sorry. That's just the way it is. They know that. Of course, they don't go out there and tell tell you that. I'll tell you that. You know, so what's you know, what's your remedy? Well, your remedy is to educate yourself to the law. Well, you know, and that's what we're that's what we're doing here. All right. So uh was was that satisfactory with respect to equal protection? Yes, it was. Uh, I also just posted a, another uh, question. Okay. All right. So hang on just a second. Uh, oh, on the uh, on the sharing text. Yes. Okay. Let me get back over there. Okay. In your last uh, mention, uh, you mentioned uh, that in 1913 they figure out how to create a lawful government out of Washington D.C. Can you explain how they did that? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to take credit for for that. Uh, uh, generally, uh, uh, I was uh, a man named Howard Freeman in an audio. And if any of you out there want to listen to that audio, it's actually pretty good. Uh, he actually explains what happened in 1913. Okay, and uh, it's about a 45-minute video. Oddly enough, it was the video I was listening to right before uh, my transfiguration. Uh, once, and in fact, I was listening to that one when, when all of a sudden the presence entered, uh, entered into my reality, and I became a new, completely new human being. Um, but his name was Howard Freeman, and technically he identified that there was a flaw in the Constitution, and it was Article One, Section Eight, Clause Seventeen. It said, Congress shall have exclusive power over Washington, D.C., the 10 square miles. All right, now I'm paraphrasing now, right? Now, they would have exclusive power over Washington, D.C., in that territory. Now, uh, after 1861, uh, we were a de facto corporation. So they figured out that under the Constitution, they had exclusive democratic power over the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C. And because there wasn't another lawful government, they decided that, hey, it, we have a, a, uh, uh, an area of land with a group of people that has a government. We, therefore qualify under international law as our own separate country. So in 1913, they created the United States of America as a, its own separate country. Of course, they didn't call it United States of America. Its real name is New Columbia. Okay. Now, federal territory, which is that little country, consists of the 10 square miles of Washington, D.C., uh, U.S. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, Guam, and let's see, I'm not sure about the Federated States of Micronesia, but though that is federal territory. Everything else is the occupied several states, okay? So when you say, hey, I am a U.S. citizen or a citizen of the United States, you are waiving your rights as being a citizen of the several states, and becoming a citizen of that little country. That little country is a democracy. It doesn't have, it isn't a representative go uh, 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 republic government. Okay, Its government is a corporation formed in the Organic Law Act of 1871, and I think I went into that. 
Uh, so in, in 1913, they created a separate country out of Washington, D.C. So when you say, I'm a U.S. citizen, you become a citizen of that little country. And you, therefore, waive all of your rights as a citizen of the several states and waive all your con constitutionally protected rights. Now, if you want more information, I would suggest, uh, and, and we could probably post it on Discord here, the link to Howard Freeman's audio. Okay, it's on. The, if you do a search for Howard Freeman audio, um, look for the audio that says the flaw in the Constitution. But it was technically Article One, Section Eight, Clause Seventeen. That's the flaw that they exploited, and he contends that God left that flaw in there so that if we ever, uh, 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 you know, uh, became immoral that God could remove all of those freedoms that were granted uh, uh, in 1776. Uh, I argue that those, those rights and freedoms um, were, were never truly secured because they were undermined immediately by, oddly enough, the Constitution itself. Individual sovereignty was undermined by the Constitution. Uh, individual sovereignty was actually established in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, there is no mention of individual sovereignty in, in the Constitution itself. So the Constitution itself was used to usurp uh, the Declaration of Independence. As a consequence, uh, people like Thomas Paine and Patrick Henry, uh, they were actually opposed to the Constitution. Uh, and that's... Uh, oh, it looks like Ileon posted that. Uh, so yeah, that's that. Yeah, that audio right there. If you want to know uh, what I was listening to that caused me to snap on, that's what it was. Um, um, n not exactly that. There was some additional stuff. I mean, if you go through the cheat sheet, you find out what law is required uh, to go ahead and make that happen. But this was the linchpin. Um, so, all right. So, w w was that satisfactory for for that? Yes. Okay. All right. So, yeah, Howard Freeman does a pretty good job. Uh, they, they, he, he talks a lot about that. Uh, uh, how to free yourself from tyranny is actually a pretty good one from Howard Freeman also. Uh, however, uh, since the time that those audio clips were actually uh, created, they have, uh, they have uh, changed, um, changed the, uh, well, I mean, uh, he found the loophole, and then they closed the loophole. Uh, technically, it's this. If you do not know the law, you are ignorant, and you are su uh, therefore subject under their authority. That's what they're using right now. So that's why I teach the law, so that that takes that away from them. So if you're knowledgeable in the law, then therefore they can't use the argument of incompetence to gain lawful authority over you. That's what all of this is about. Okay. Um, anybody have any questions uh, thus far? I'm good. Okay. Nope. Okay. All right. So what I want to do is I, I want to start. Uh, something has come up uh, a number of times. People are out there, and I hear people uh, uh, really concerned about something, and, and, and it's something to really, truly be concerned about, and that is corporate accountability. Okay. H how do you hold an entity of fiction accountable? Well, the answer is, you don't. All is fair in fiction. Now, if you want to conduct business and call yourself the Easter Bunny, you're not going to be able to hold the Easter Bunny accountable to anything. Does that make sense? Yep. Because that's what a corporation is. Corporation is specifically designed as a commercial fictional entity to immunize the people who are part of that corporation from personal liability. And since the corporation itself, you can't shake his hand, like Walmart Corporation, you, uh, you can't shake his or her hand. Okay, There's a bunch of people that say they work on the behalf of Walmart, uh, I can't verify that. Why? Because I can't talk to Mr. or Mrs. Walmart and say, hey, do these people speak in uh, uh, under your authority? 
So technically, it's a material fraud for anybody to say that they actually represent a corporation. Why? Because the corporation itself doesn't have a mind. It's a mindless fiction. It has no power. Okay? <coughs> so, <coughs> and you can't hold something that exists only in people's minds accountable. It's a problem. Okay? So, uh, the corporations are the product of the banks. And it was to immunize them from their their own activities, meaning that they could go and comport themselves in any fashion that they thought, uh, any way they want. And uh, of course, we lack the uh, we lack the ability to go against uh, their personal uh, property. Okay, that's a problem. Okay, and so you're wondering why companies like BP can destroy entire food webs. Uh, and uh, and companies like Monsanto can can literally give everyone a tumor. Uh, then th that's the reason, because they have no fear of any of them being held accountable. And even if there is a, a criminal activity, uh, it, it doesn't fall back on the corporate organization at all. Or they might be an actor, and you know, once in a while they'll they'll go after a specific corporate uh, corporate officer. Uh, but it, it doesn't, you know, the the company itself just you know still keeps uh, uh, you know moving on. Like for instance, Dupont. Okay, they had a plant that blew up and killed hundreds of people in uh, in India. Uh, they paid very little, if anything for for uh, you know for this this chemical leak that that literally poisoned uh, you know thousands of people over there in, in New Delhi right well yeah even if they can win uh, <coughs> hundreds of billions of dollars in in restorations uh it, that's still not really accountability no person is being held accountable they just that's just fake money anyways yeah well and i mean they 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 they, uh, they fake the the accountability by by paying out and we think that that hurts them but it doesn't well, I mean, you know, if you take a good look at TV uh, and you watch TV, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I do know uh, when I do see it, you know, um, that all I see is like drug commercials. And it seems that all the drug, uh, all the drugs that they're producing now all have these, you know, incredibly bad side effects. And, and of course, that serves notice when they tell you, hey, it could cause this sudden death and all those other things. So uh, um, when when a drug company uh, and then once you know like for instance Nexium right all of the all of the anti uh, 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 acid reflux medications that were causing additional problems everybody then forms a class action lawsuit and then the uh, lawyers step in and uh, they arrange uh, a settlement from the company well the first condition to participate in a class action lawsuit is that you waive your rights to bring any additional charges against the company. That's a big problem. Uh, if they negotiate, the, you're basically telling them that, oh, if I participate in this class action lawsuit, that, uh, uh, that I waive any of my rights to actually sue the company independently. That's the first condition of these, uh, uh, these class action lawsuits. At, at which point then, too, the governor, uh, company says, oh, well, okay, yeah, we, uh, you know, uh, we, had, we were sued in a class action lawsuit. We made a deal. So uh, that deal stands, and, and we don't have to be subject to any additional, uh, uh, any, uh, additional liability. No, that's not true. Okay, and, and the reason it's not true is because when you, to, to actually uh, uh, seek damages against a company, uh, if you're forced to waive the uh, rights of actually negotiating your own settlement for your own case, uh, you can do that completely separately. Now, here's the issue. If the company settles, okay, uh, it, whether or not it... Uh, if it assumes liability, that's a slam dunk. Okay, so the company in a class action lawsuit assumes liability, pays the settlement, okay, at which point you can use the fact that they settled over, uh, 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 you know, uh, going to court 
and, and, and prevailing in court as evidence that, hey, there's something really, really here. Now, of course, you have to go through and you have to scientifically prove that the company was doing that. But this whole process, right, this whole thing is part of a business model. Okay, so if I'm a drug company, I immediately know what the number is that I'm going to settle on when my drug creates problems for people out there in the marketplace. That's already factored into the cost of the drugs. So I can go and comport, do my business producing, producing drugs, knowing full well that these drugs uh, are going to create problems, and I already have a number that I'm going to settle on. Okay, at which point uh, it, it's just part of a business model, right? They've already pre, they've they've already uh, they've already figured out that uh, what they're doing is causing problems, and they've already uh, factored in their own uh, financial liability. If if we were smart, these companies that come up with these class action lawsuits. Um, these, uh, I, I'd say that those those people that are in that class dump the attorneys that are doing the negotiation and actually file file criminal charges against the corporation, pursue that completely independently, and uh, and and don't settle. That will that will cause them to rethink their quote unquote business models. Now it may make your drugs more expensive, but my idea is I don't care how cheap your drugs are. If they're killing you, you shouldn't be taking them. And these people should be advocating uh, this junk that, that they're calling uh, useful to us. I mean, you know, uh, treating one symptom and then introducing a whole host of uh, potentially dangerous side effects it is no trade off. So, I mean, I don't look at things that way. I mean, I, sometimes it's almost better to live with the disease than it is to take some of these medications. I, I think my my mother took uh, a particular medication, ended up causing nerve damage, you know, and she ended up worse off uh, than when she started. I mean, you know, it, it just, and, and she's not the exception. That That's going on all over the place. So uh, the, the whole idea is we've got, we've got, Entities that are doing business, engaging in commerce, right, selling snake oil and all manner of poisons and, 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 and detrimental products, dangerous products, and we really substantively have no way of actually holding them uh, accountable because of their, because of the entities that they're in. Now, can it be solved? Yeah, I got an idea solving uh, the I, uh, uh, it, you know, the fact is corporations exist. Some of them are very large. I mean, it'd be really easy to get those guys under control and hold them accountable. Um, uh, basically, it, go, it, it goes like this, right? You tell, you notify all corporations operating in a particular area that in three years, you are going to have to designate someone or or uh, depending on the size of your company uh, some ones who are strictly liable for the lawful comportment of that that company or corporation and if you do not have somebody that we can put in jail then you don't do business here let's say in Texas so the governor would come out and say, hmm, all you corporations that are currently operating here in Texas, you have five years to change your structure so that you have somebody that we can hold strictly liable for the behavior of your corporation as it does business here in our state. And if you do not have somebody that we can hold accountable, then you do not do business here in this state. Right? Now what's going to happen? Right? Anybody, uh, if all of a sudden a company doing business here in Texas has to have a guy that could be held criminally liable, right? What, what do you think happens to the corporation? Anybody out there? If all of a sudden Google has to have somebody here in Texas that we can put in jail for the activities of the corporation, what do you think happens to Google? Their structure changes. Absolutely. Why? Because if 
let's say for instance I, I I work in Google and they say hey how would you like to be the fidu you know the the liability or the the fiduciary right not necessarily a financial but the uh, you know the the lawfully responsible party or entity uh, for for Google Corporation such that if the corporation does something that's against the law that uh, they're going to put you in jail uh, we'll, and they offered that to me. First thing I would do is says, "Yeah, I had no problem, but I am not going to take responsibility for anything I don't have the authority over, and I don't have a problem with that. But you do what I tell you to do, and not what you do. So everything that this corporation does here in Texas has to be vetted through me, so that I can ensure that I'm not going to go to jail." And if Google can't find somebody who will assume that responsibility, then Google doesn't do business here in Texas. It's as simple as that. So companies who are honest and companies who uh, truly try to be good citizens, uh, they don't have any problem. So that's, that's an easy way of, and, and, and what does that mean? Well, corporations were never a good idea. Why? Because the whole idea of absolving somebody of personal responsibility is, is yeah, oh, yeah, you can grow huge corporations, uh, but it, it, what you have is a bunch of criminals running around doing things without any kind of fear of prosecution, using other people's money to create all kinds of mischief, mayhem, and, and, uh, and damage uh, without any real uh, accountability. Nobody goes to jail over this stuff. Oh, they might get fired. So what? But I tell you what, somebody at BP needed to be in prison. And we could very quickly convert from a corporate architecture to a a a ent to entities who are are both lawfully and legally accountable. Oh, okay, so Roadhouse says, he says, if you start a corporation here in Canada, the directors are liable for taxes only, nothing else. Oh, of course. Yeah, because it's created under the authority of, uh, you know, the central banking. And, and look, I mean, uh, Thomas Jefferson warned us about that. Uh, you know, he, he said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, banks are more dangerous than standing armies. And he says, if we ever let banks gain control over the issuance of our money, then the corporations that grow up around them, and I'm paraphrasing here, uh, that grow up around uh, the banks uh, will uh, uh, make the American people trespassers in their own country. Well, guess what? Foreign-owned central bank controls the issuance of our money. And are we not trespassers in our own country? So, Absolutely. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah, the Kaffir. So, uh, Roadhouse, he, he, yeah, the, the government's true wealth exposed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The government keeps two sets of books. Exactly. If you don't know what CAFR is, yeah, go go take a look at that. That that'll that'll aggravate you. Tell you, um, you find out that uh, uh, you you're te you technically pay income tax for one thing, and that is to create an artificial obligation to manipulate you and control every aspect of your life. That's all it's there for. That's all an income tax is. It's a, it's a control mechanism, and 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 quite frankly, uh, Donald Tr President Donald Trump right now is showing people that wait a minute, we can fund the government without any type of income taxes. Income taxes do only one thing. They don't pay pay for roads. They don't pay for schools. They don't pay for Medicare, Medicaid, or anything else. They don't even pay for the military. They don't pay for anything except the privilege of using the Federal Reserve's currency, the Federal Reserve note. That's all it is. All it does is it pays the debt. And that's merely a privilege to use their money. 
Well, we don't have to pay for that privilege. We just uh, give them the whole heave and we issue our own treasury notes uh, without any debt. We can have the debt paid off uh, maybe as shortly as two years, and uh, we won't even need to look back. Uh, I'm not even opposed to a world currency, provided it's not a debt-based currency. Uh, if it's a uh, if it's a reasonably managed currency uh, that is out of the hands of a private group over the supervision of governments under the specific consensual control of every man woman on this planet I don't have a problem with that at all but having the issuance of money into the hands of private uh, pr uh, private you know uh, companies or private citizens well uh, that don't work for me because eventually what happens is uh, they gain control over your governments, they manipulate your governments, and they uh, end up taking everything. And this is a problem we have here in this country right now or in the world, is that the central bank is soaking up all of our abundance. And what are we doing? We're, we're paying off these debts. Why? Uh, these debts, in large part, are due only because of the kind of money that we use and the fact that the whole system is completely rigged and you and engages in usury uh, to the point where uh, you know we don't have the kind of we don't have the availability of currency to even do business. We pay punishing taxes. We have pay here in the United States. We pay taxes on our inventory. It is the stupidest thing that I've ever heard of. You tax industry. What do you do? Well, you're just stepping on people's uh, the means that people sustain themselves and and amass wealth. Like it's a total buzz killer, folks. Right? That's why when you walk in the store, they don't have anything. Why? Because they don't sell you what they need, what you need. They sell you what sells. Because they've analyzed every square foot of that retail space, and they've they've decided that that retail space has to perform a, a uh, you know to a certain level, and if what you need doesn't sell enough to support that arbitrary number that they assign, then they 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 clearance it out and they don't carry it anymore. Why? Because their inventories are taxed. Yeah, they have to have inventory that moves. They have to have inventory that pays itself, and it, and it pays for itself. So ultimately, uh, it, does anybody know what Walmart sells most of? Anybody know what their number one product is as far as volume? House fans? Bananas. Right? So you go to the Home Depot, and you go to Lowe's, Right. Eventually, uh, given enough time and, and, and using this system, uh, both Walmart, uh, then it doesn't make sense to carry anything else. Uh, th uh, they'll all just sell bananas. And you'll be left trying to fashion your own stuff by yourself. I mean, it's it, it's a completely absurd notion to tax inventory. And we do this here in this country, and we think, oh, well, hey, you know, that, that's just the way it is because we've been doing it for so long. Well, wait a minute. You don't do that. That's nobody's business. That's your business, not their business. And, and, and whether or not you have uh, a, an inventory is nothing to do with the Internal Revenue Service whatsoever. Because I, 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 I resent the fact that a privately owned central bank thinks that they have the authority to tell me, you, and everybody else how much wealth you can amass. Because they'll go through and they'll kick in some sort of arbitrary number to put you right on out of business or soak up everything that you own. Soon as you, soon as you start making money, they're going to consider you a threat and they're going to take all your stuff. They need to go today, if possible. Oh, I was wearing the devil suit. Did you like that? You're here. Love that rant, man. Well, I mean, these people have been soaking up our worldwide... You wonder why starving South Americans are, are marching up here, 
right? And 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 we can conveniently blame socialism for what's going on in Venezuela. Okay, yeah, we we can conveniently do that. Anytime you see a ism at the end of the word, you can blame a central bank for that because it all goes back to uh, cent they're all central bank stooges. Okay, and so central bank creates these isms that that we sit here and we employ, and it ends up being a, a, a course. It's socialism is a direct. Uh, in direct conflict with capitalism. Yeah, those isms are designed that way. Why? Because it really doesn't matter whether it's a capitalist system or it's a socialist system. The bank takes everything. And who are these people? They're private people. Taking your stuff without, give, without you know, giving you the courtesy of hitting you over the head for, uh, for it. You know, and inflation and, and, and their worthless money that they just arbitrarily just print and print and print and print with no regard to, to uh, uh, you know, whether or not it damages the economy or whether or not the, uh, and, 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 you know, shoot, look at the United States. They're starving us uh, 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 of useful currency. The amount of dollars that are available per capita in, in this country per person it has been going down, just like it has been, in, uh, just like it did in the Great Depression. Now, during the Great Depression, I think around 1929, there was roughly $1,200 for every man, uh, a man, I think, a man, woman, and child in the United States. $1,200 per person. By the time the uh, Depression ended, it went down to $6 per person. Okay? Tell you what, more people starved in the United States than history wants to admit. And you can lay that right on the banks. They did that. So who's James Comey? James Comey works for Goldman Sachs. Who's Loretta Lynch? Loretta Lynch worked for the New York Attorney General's office. I believe she was the Attorney General of New York. It was James Comey and Loretta Lynch that negotiated because uh, James Comey worked for, I believe it was HSBC, and they sat and negotiated a settlement for HSBC because uh, HSBC was laundering money or, do, uh, or bond rigging or something like that. So those two actually negotiated, uh, uh, I, I mean, not even a slap in a hand. Uh, what they negotiated was a, a deal where every man, woman, and child on this planet got spit in their face. And you can't tell me that a bank doesn't know where every single penny is spent on this planet. You want to see what the problem is? All of these people that deal in drugs, all these people that deal in arms, all of these people that are engaged in all of these clandestine criminal activities... The banks know every single operator. They know exactly where the money's moving at any time, all the time. And if you want to find out who's doing something, all you'd have to do is ask the bankers and make them tell you. They're involved in everything. And if you don't like the fact that drugs are poisoning all your kids, you can thank a banker for that. Why? Because they know exactly where this money is moving, and they know who's moving it. It's their system. So how come we don't ever point a, a discriminating eye their way? Well, because they sort of stand in the back. We never look and see oh, whether or not they're the ones that are actually doing it. These people are criminal scum. We do not need a foreign-owned central bank in charge of the issuance of our money. There is nobody, no country or group of people on this planet that needs a foreign-owned central bank managing the issuance of their money supply. Period. End of story. Why we do this and why politicians and people in government pretend that this isn't going on and refuse to tell people that this is what's going on boggles my mind. Mine as well. Oh, hey, you got your mic on. Right? So you, you got people over there that do right, but here, here you got this, this, this you know, 800-pound gorilla in the room, and, and, and nobody 
nobody tells the American people, hey, well, the, the, the reason why, you know, we're all financially strapped and our economy is crap is because the central bank has basically been running a scam. Since the inception of this country, we've been, we've been fighting the banks. It's time to get rid of these people. I mean, all of them. They're weak. They're few. They're only 1%. We're 99. We need to come up with alternative systems. Maybe we just need to recognize who the true enemy is and actually go after them. You get rid of the central banks, and I'll tell you what, there's a whole lot less that we even need to fight over here on this planet. I don't know why we, we, we tolerate it. Because we don't know. So, well, sorry for the rant, folks. I, I agree with you. It's especially an excellent the you, rant. Especially the more you learn, the more you learn, the more mad you get about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you know, uh, and, and who am I mad at? Am I mad at the bankers? No, I'm mad at the people who think they know how, how their money works and how their economy works and how, how, how reality works. And, and quite frankly, they don't. They just assume that. Why? I mean, you know, they're, they're walking around uh, and, and they conspire with criminals to victimize themselves. I mean, it's mind-boggling. All they have to do is stop doing that. You know? So, I mean, you know, hey, share this video. I'm sure YouTube, they won't like it. I mean, did I advocate any violence here? One time? No. no? Okay, there's no violence. Was there any hate here besides uh, hate for criminal activity, which is uh, perfectly fine? Anything there that, that, that arose to any level of controversy? Anything? Yeah. Huh? No. no. Least, I mean, we, we don't put up with the pedophiles, and we don't put up with other criminals, and the, the general population is so brainwashed they can't see the, the insanity and the nonsense of what's going on around them, and that's what the problem is. And I suppose if I was a central banker, I'd be rubbing my hands too. Well, yeah, you can't blame them for our stupidity. Exactly. You know, I mean, and what has to change here? The banks? No, the banks, they've known this for a long time. What has to change is us. We are the problem. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, you know, I, we're not a threat to the bank. What we are a threat to is ignorant people that have no idea uh, of what's going, what they're doing to themselves, you know. And shoot, uh, there should be absolutely no reason why I should be under any shadow banning or any filtering. Uh, but, uh, I mean, you know, you, you, you look at the number of views on the videos. I mean, it's totally suppressed. They don't want to hear this stuff. Why? Because, you know, I got real ideas. I know who the enemies are. And I know who. And it doesn't mean I'm going to go and take them out or anything like that. I mean, that's absurd. There's no reason for violence here. Just simply awareness. We can, we can decide to live a different life on this planet. It just, you know, when are we going to, when are we going to make those decisions? That's, that's the key. You know, I, I don't want people suffering. And right now, people are suffering. You know, I, I mean, the the reason people are coming up from South America is because their countries themselves have turned into absolutely corrupt, right? Corrupt entities. The governments are completely corrupt. The banking system has saddled the country with so much debt; it's un, absolutely unpayable. So these people, you know, heaven forbid, they want to come here and eat. You can't really blame them for doing that. But it's really not the fault of any government, per se, because they're under the thumb of the central banks. That's where the problem is. If you want to... Well, I think I, I might, um, might change that a little bit to say that I think the government likes the system the way it is because they can then go and get money by borrowing without actually bringing issues to the people. Well, yeah, until until somebody decides that, uh, uh, well, hey, uh, you taking all the natural resources of our country is kind of a problem, and then they decide that, oh, wait a minute, you got to go. 
So, uh, you know, that that's one of the problems that was happening in Venezuela. Venezuela wanted when, to get rid when, of this. When will things change? I, I think things will change when there's an absolute um, <laughs> disaster, unfortunately. And that seems to be the only time things start to change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you, look, it, it, it's when your oxen gets gored where you start actually paying attention. You know, and then, of course, it's just you and your ox, and then you have to wait for everybody else's oxen to get gored. But, you know, hey, I don't want to sit around hoping hoping everybody else suffers like I do, like I did. You don't want to go through that. I, I, I mean, you know, if, if I got anything or earned anything by having that experience, it's that I'd just rather not everybody on, in the United States or on this planet have to go through the same thing that I went through. Should have been enough. But if that's what it's going to take before people start really uh, waking up to, to their responsibility, then I guess that's what has to happen, right? You know? Uh, I mean, uh, I don't want it. But if that's the, that the only way that people snap out of it, then, you know, I don't know. I, you know, I guess it's got to be that way. I don't know. You know? I'm going to try to avoid it as much as possible. Uh, but, you know, really, <laughs> look at the number of views. <laughs> Nobody's beating yeah. a path to my door. Well, barring divine intervention, I I don't see any end to this. Yeah. It's so firmly entrenched. Society seems to be less aware of real issues um, as, you know, the majority of people, as, as you like to call them, the Twinkies. <laughs> more concerned with Kim Kardashian's rear end than they are with their their own financial system or their own um, their own system of government oh, well, until it affects them directly they're you know they, they they couldn't care less well or or they're looking you know they're happy when they see justice in Jesse Smollett's case I mean so what I mean that is a whole there's a huge nothing there I mean, you know, the, the, the guy is pathetic. I mean, and not only that, but the entire law enforcement community that, that just fell down and, and, and the judicial system in, in Illinois was completely pathetic. I mean, just shameful, embarrassing, disgusting. You know, and then people think that that's actually something that's, that they should be occupying their, uh, their time with. Are you kidding? That's small potatoes. I mean, they're systemically raping and murdering our children that's what's going on here folks you know and they just don't want people to finding out finding that out you know that that we're actually prey you know no heaven forbid the cows figure out that we're eating them <laughs> <laughs> you know ah uh, you know quite frankly uh, uh, you know i, I with as long as they've been looting our country, uh, honestly, I, I think the only thing of value left that they haven't already looted is our body parts. That's a pretty sobering reality, but I'm afraid that, you know, th this this we may just be a huge store for spare parts. Yeah, well, I think they've already started in on that, too. Yeah. So... All right, folks. I think I'm going to terminate the recording and then and then come back here. So uh, uh, it it was nice having this discussion, and hopefully I didn't scare all of you folks. Uh, so that's the uh, you know I just want to you know fade out, and uh, I'm going to continue these uh, I guess Wednesday night discussions slash rants. <laughs> so, but uh, no, folks. I'm not really angry. <laughs> You know, and no, it's no frustration. It's just, uh, it's just an interesting show to watch. So that's, uh, that's all it is. So uh, you got you folks okay out there? Any more? Any other questions? No, thank you, Roach. All right. Well, I'm going to sign off, and uh, we will talk to you next Wednesday. Uh, this is Roach, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye bye. <laughs>